tonight. Another overdose claims a life. It comes on the heels of a police warning to the public. Uh, fentanyl, as people are learning very quickly, is very, very, very powerful uh, opiate. The province's top bureaucrat still working as a lawyer. The opposition is swirling over what it's calling a conflict of interest. It's kind of like going to work today uh, and saying to your employer, I love working here, what a great job. And by the way, when I get off work four o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to sue you. We are getting reports of aliens sighted in St. John's, but not just aliens. We're seeing superheroes, anime princesses, Jedi knights, and a bunch of stuff I can't even explain. It's sci-fi on the rock, and we'll take you there live. And in the weather department, we are tracking a pretty nice Saturday across central eastern parts of the island, a brighter but cooler Sunday for the west into Labrador. The details are coming up. Our top story tonight, another deadly overdose on the Avalon. A woman was found dead in a home on Empire Avenue in St. John's. And tonight, police say fentanyl was the cause. It's something the province has been waiting for as the deadly street drug sweeps across the country. Here now is Arianna Kelland has been following the story and she joins us now live. So Arianna, what can you tell us? Well, we do know that this is the second fatal overdose in two weeks, the result of what's believed to be a bad batch of drugs on the Northeast Avalon. Now, we know that the woman who died was 39 years old. She was found inside of a home but could not be revived. But tonight, there is a call to action for drug users and their loved ones to get the antidote before it's too late. This was the scene on Empire Avenue last night. Road closed, officers in protective gear walking inside a home where a woman was dead inside. An overdose. The same day, officials warned that life-threatening drugs were on the street and had already claimed one life. It's been a busy two weeks for paramedics like Jennifer Regular. A lot of times uh, we enter these scenes, uh, the patient is unresponsive, uh, bluish coloring to them. Very hard to arouse. They can be uh, breathing very slow or not at all. Most people who overdose are brought back to life by this tiny vial of naloxone or Narcan. If you come across someone having an overdose, the first step is to call 911. Then use a naloxone kit if there's one handy. Within minutes could cause severe uh, brain damage. Oh no, this is it. You know, this is the thin edge of the wedge. Uh, we know it's coming. Tree Walsh has been waiting for the fentanyl crisis to reach Newfoundland. She's given out six life-saving naloxone kits this week, a record. Enough for a warning for drug users that fentanyl can be anywhere. If people use cocaine, they should have a naloxone kit and they should know how to use it. It doesn't matter what drug it is, everything is being tainted. Police want to know how it got into the province and who's selling it. We've seen at least uh, 16 reported drug-related overdoses. We have reason to believe there's been significantly more than that. The stakes are high, but for drug dealers, fentanyl has its perks. It's cheap and can be mixed with other drugs, giving a more powerful high. We don't condone usage, but they need to practice safe usage. Uh, they, you know, if you're going to use uh, an illicit drug of that nature, then maybe doing something in pairs making sure you're, uh, you have uh, some of the uh, Narcon kits have been provided by the province that are out there. So people need to be safe. Now, this is not the first time fentanyl has been seen in this province. There have been fentanyl deaths in the past, and last year, police seized fentanyl pills. But there's no way to tell where these drugs are and how long they'll be in circulation on the streets. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland in St. John's. Thanks very much, Ariana. And as Ariana mentioned, if you see someone who's having an overdose, the first step is to call 911. And if one is available, to use a naloxone kit. Here's Karen Singleton from Eastern Health walking us through how to use one of those kits. The first thing is you're going to pull this out because even though you're probably going to be trained before you use an naloxone kit, in the event of an emergency you could be nervous, really upset, and this is kind of a very quick, short way to make sure you're doing the steps correctly. So as I already said, you have to shake and shout, and if the person is unresponsive, then you can pretty much uh, guess that they may be in an opiate overdose, in which case you call 911. Before you give the naloxone, first thing you do is you tilt 
their chin and their head back and you give two breaths as if you were doing it in CPR. Just make sure there's nothing in the airway. Give two clean breaths and see if their chest rises and observe them. If they're still not breathing, if they're still in the same state as when you uh, happened upon them, then you get your naloxone ready. So in the actual kit, the naloxone is here. It's just two vials. Uh, they're golden in color and we always get people to make sure the expiry date uh, that they haven't expired. We use the alcohol swab only for cracking. So once we know the liquid is down there, we take the swab, we wrap it around the neck of the ampule and you crack it away from you because it is glass and you'll hear a little snap sometimes like that. The beauty of these needles is that um, the top of the needle actually goes back in, so it's retractable, uh, much like an EpiPen. There's no fancy way of doing it. Um, basically, we want to get all that liquid into the needle. When you're giving it to the person, um, you don't have to take off, remove any clothing. Uh, you just go over and you give it into one of their muscles, either their bum cheek, their thigh, their arm. Um, we want to get it into a major muscle. So you go over after you're shaking and shouting and the breaths and you go over and you find, you know, their thigh. You take the needle, you jab it in, and you press down until you hear a click. And the top disappears. So that's not going to stick anybody. If there's still no change, you continue doing the rescue breathing. So about every five seconds, you do the two breaths and you keep looking. If after about two minutes, you find that there's still no change, you go ahead and you repeat the process again, give the second dose. Hopefully after that time, if there's no change, that the ambulance will be on the way. Uh, but sometimes after the second dose, the person can, you know, wake up, come to. Well, the top bureaucrat in the province is facing an allegation of conflict of interest tonight. Burn Coffey is the clerk of the Executive Council, which is responsible for the overall operations of government. Coffey is also a practicing lawyer. He's been given permission by the government to sue the government mm -hmm. and to potentially profit from suing the government when he's paid a good price to protect and defend the government. Coffee is representing a former Nalcor employee who's suing the Crown Corporation for wrongful termination. Well, tonight, opposition leader Paul Davis is criticizing the Premier for allowing Coffee to handle that case for the former employee. Coffee has continued to represent clients that had prior that he had prior to taking the senior position in government, but Davis says there is no way he can separate his day job and his after-hours law practice. Now, the opposition has even released a social media attack ad you see here targeting. Coffee. Coffee. It's kind of like going to work today and, and saying to your employer, I love working here, what a great job. And by the way, when I get off work four o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to sue you and I'm going to support someone who's going to be critical of your own business. You, you can't do that. And as a clerk at the executive council, how can you work in the best interest of the province? If you have extra time on your hands and an opportunity to do more work at a time of all times, right now in, in all times of our history as a province, Everybody needs to be pulling their oars together, making their best efforts. Well, the Premier wasn't available for comment today, but Paul Davis had much more to say on this, and that's later in the show. The province's Child Death Review Committee has submitted a report due to a case of sudden infant death syndrome in 2016. The report was given to the Justice Minister and the Child and Youth Advocate. It recommends that Labrador Grantville Health continue to speak with officials in Innu Health and social services programs about culturally appropriate responses to prevent SIDS deaths in Innu communities. Well, a new report shows the College of the North Atlantic is plagued with problems. Government released a study today. It shows there is no quality control over programs, that the college is spending beyond its means, and its IT system is so antiquated that the college is at risk. Well, here now, Cease Hare joins us live in studio tonight. So, Cease, what's going on at the college? Well, uh, Carolyn, the report contains just a litany of deficiencies. On the academic side, for example, student support is said to be in a critical state at College of the North Atlantic. And then there is this troubling statement from the board, from the report. The college has been neglecting the importance of teaching for several years. A national accrediting body has placed one of the college's programs on probation. 
although it doesn't say which one. And this report goes on to say that courses need to be modernized, programs don't match the labor market, and CNA isn't doing proper evaluations. Then there are the money problems. The report says the college has been living beyond its limits, running continuous deficits. There's questionable spending. For example, money earmarked for salaries of vacant positions was spent to cover other costs. Now, Jerry Byrne is the minister responsible for the College of the North Atlantic. I spoke with him today from Stephenville on the telephone, which is where he released that report. He acknowledged the problems and says there are even more. Four vehicles not associated with academic programming within a college campus of 17, uh, 17 campuses. You've got spending surplus cash outside of the budgetary process. IT systems, which had been neglected for years. Courses for, you know, being offered for which there were very, very, very few applicants or eligible students that were applying to get in. Fixing CNA's money problems is already underway. Since the review was completed, the college has found $10 million in savings and has a balanced budget now for the first time in almost 20 years. And here's how some of that happened. The college cut discretionary spending by about 30% and saved $1.6 million. It reduced the size of its vehicle fleet, saving 35% in its fleet operations. And the college is now using its own people for marketing. Two years ago, it paid $1.4 million to a single agency for a rebranding campaign. Jerry Byrne, the minister, says CNA's road to recovery is already underway and he has more confidence in the college today after making this report public than he did yesterday. Debbie? Thank you, Cease. The provincial government is standing firm on its controversial decision to relocate the Crown Lands branch office and the 30 or so jobs that go with it from St. John's to Cornerbrook. The man in charge of the new Department of Fisheries and Land Resources says it will create efficiencies and save tax dollars. Here now's Terry Roberts has that story. Steve Crocker says he sympathizes with the people in this building who will be affected by this move. And he says they will be treated with respect and understanding. But he says the benefits are just too good to pass up. And what about the accusation that this is purely politically driven? That it's being done to prop up the political base of Premier Dwight Ball and other West Coast MHAs? Not so, says Steve Crocker. Absolutely not. This is about providing a service in the most effective, efficient way for the taxpayers in this province. When the new Department of Fisheries and Land Resources was created in February, Crocker says it quickly became apparent that efficiencies could be found. Placing all the mapping divisions under one roof, cross-training employees to avoid duplication, and even reducing the amount of space leased by the government. You know, I can assure you that as a department, if you come back and check with me in six months from now, in Cornerbrook, this department will have less lease space than it has today. Steve Crocker says employees who don't want to move may be able to find other jobs here with government, but he says there's no going back on this decision. The minister says the move will likely take place in early summer, and he stressed that if you deal with Crown Lands here in eastern Newfoundland, your service will remain unchanged. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there was a somber ceremony at Confederation Building in St. John's today to mark the National Day of Mourning for workers killed or injured in the workplace. The large crowd was told that in this province, workplace injuries have gone down, but there has been an increase in workplace violence. Hockey tonight, maybe golf tomorrow for the St. John's Ice Caps. It's all on the line as the baby Canadians face the Syracuse Crunch in New York in AHL playoff action. Tonight it's game four in a best of five series and the Ice Caps are already down two games to one. If they lose, they won't return to mile one as the team's time in St. John's comes to a close at the end of their season. Some grocery shoppers in St. John's got a nice Friday surprise. It happened at the Dominion on Black Marsh Road this afternoon. And here now is Mark Quinn was there to witness it. So, Mark, what happened at the store? 
Well, Carolyn, it was nice to have a good news story for a change. And uh, what happened today is that uh, the Dominion on Black Marsh Road is actually channeling Oprah Winfrey. It wasn't quite as extravagant as everyone gets a car, but uh, the store did give away thousands of dollars worth of groceries. And here's how it worked. Everyone who was in line at 4 o'clock got all the groceries that they had with them in line, and they got them for free. So here's how it happened, and here's what it... Um, actually, it's my dad's birthday, so now I guess his birthday gift is free. <laughs> pretty sweet, pretty sweet, just pure luck. Because yeah. the lady in front of us was served before us, and she left, and then as soon as she left, and they told us to stop and end up getting free groceries. So what'd you haul in? Uh, $102, not Excellent. bad, up to yeah. $250, it's a pretty sweet deal. I'm amazed, I can't believe it. Especially groceries are so expensive today to eat. How much do you figure you saved? Oh, I saved a nice spirit, but if I know I was getting free, I would have put a lot more steaks in <laughs> for my barbecue. What's it like to give away groceries? Excellent. <laughs> but it's better to be able to have the music to dance. <laughs> say probably 150 or 200 dollars, probably. Excellent. Yeah. Do you wish you had bought some more luxury items? Uh, no, I think I did okay, really. Excellent. I have a couple dinners coming up, so I was prepping for those, so this worked out really well. What kind of reaction do you get from customers? Uh, you know what, everything from uh, tears to high fives to just overall joy. I mean, uh, not often you get something for free. And that last person was uh, Dominion Black Marsh store manager John Pritchett. And he says it's called a customer appreciation event. It's happened to hundreds of stores across the country. And of course, it's not a bad way to start a weekend. Coming up on Sci-Fi on the Rock, we'll speak with the organizers of this great convention to see what makes it so successful. What, did you think it was Deadpool recording? We can't let him talk, it's a family show. Stick around, we'll be right back.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Before we get to the weather, some mornings just unexpected things happen, <laughs> don't they? Right. I understand this you morning was one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting morning. Yeah, a yeah. couple of moose on the loose in uh, your neck of the woods this morning. Yeah, it was a real surprise to look out the window and uh, see these uh, two little uh, yearlings uh, bopping around in the neighborhood. Uh, they were running around in a backyard in uh, in the neighborhood of the like old Memorial Stadium uh, near Kingsbridge Road, and it certainly caused quite a fuss. Of course, until the conservation officers were able to take the moose back into the woods. That's right. Also, so a happy ending, yeah. right? They were uh, just moved them back into a more comfortable location for them, and uh, certainly a better ending than uh, them getting hit by a car. Oh yeah. Uh, in downtown St. John's. Busy time of the day too, with the traffic, mm. and uh, they were leaping over fences. So hopefully, they're all safe and sound back in the woods where they should be where they should be so the best part of the story is that you bolted out of your house in your pajamas to shoot well, that <laughs> i wasn't quite in my pajamas but i didn't i didn't have a coat on i looked out and i saw the moose and you know you're a reporter so i grabbed my phone and i just bolt out of the house and run across the street through the traffic <laughs> screaming moose moose <laughs> it was your slippers on still uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you no, I managed to okay, get okay. them on, didn't yeah. do them up, but <laughs> anyway, well, that would have been a it was a bit scene. of a sight. <laughs> uh, so uh, obviously a bit of a foggy start to the day and what a crazy day it was in St. John's in terms of temperatures. Look at these highs today along the east side of Metro and the north end, Torbay, Flat Rock, Logie Bay, temperatures peaked at five or six degrees. You work your way inland and temperatures warmed up all the way to 18 in Mount Pearl today and wow. the south end of St. John's. And these aren't just a couple 18? of different 18. stations. There were all kinds of weather stations in the 16 to 18 degree range from the south end of St. John's through Mount Pearl to the Goulds. Paradise got to 14. Portugal Cove St. Phillips got to 12. YYT got to 14 and then plummeted to four degrees. Uh, an hour later, as the winds shifted to northeast, there was a battle with the sea breeze here uh, through this afternoon. The sea breeze did win out in the end uh, at uh, for St. John's, and you can see where CBS just at six degrees with those onshore winds there. What was happening today? We didn't see that pronounced southwesterly flow kick in as we were thinking, and so as a result, uh, we just didn't get the warm air pumping in right across the northeast Avalon. We will see that tonight into tomorrow as those southwest winds become a little pronounced. And how about a little slow clap? The first 20 degree officially weather station across the province for this spring, Wreck House today hit 20 degrees and areas in the Codroy Valley. So we're making some progress slowly, slowly but surely. 18 in Stephenville today. Uh, you can see where temperatures are now rising above the freezing mark across Labrador slowly but surely as this front moves north. By the way, remember I said St. John's dropped to four, now back to 12 as that southwest wind comes in a little bit stronger. So we've been seeing a roller coaster ride in terms of temps. Still freezing rain warnings in effect for the northern peninsula up through the coast of Labrador. All of the unsettled crazy weather along this front, which is slowly but surely lifting to the north. We are going to see that warmer air creep in through tonight into tomorrow. As that front does lift northward, the southerly flow takes over. Good chance of showers tonight in through Saturday morning, but a break for Saturday afternoon. Central and east scattered showers into the afternoon along the west coast, and then this cold front slides through, and so a much cooler Sunday. So we're going to want to get out and enjoy the Saturday temps. We'll start in the Four, five, six, even seven degree range across the island again with a very good chance of showers uh, for most. And then as we work throughout the day, those scattered shower chances really start to ease off. Better chance of sun. And yeah, talking about 14, 15, 16 degrees in the metro region for tomorrow, uh, for tomorrow afternoon when the showers will be pretty much wrapped up. Still an isolated risk, but more than not, a sun and cloud mix for the afternoon. 13 away from onshore winds for the Buren. If you're on the west side of the Buren Peninsula in Fortune Bay, likely closer to five or six. There are those showers clearing in central. Again, 14, 15 degrees for most. Cooler in the onshore winds to the south coast and along the north coast. There are those showers clearing for the west coast. Still a cloudier afternoon, though, with that onshore uh, southwest flow. Temperatures near 10 
degrees closer to the coast, 14 in the Humber Valley tomorrow. Showers clearing for the Northern Peninsula tomorrow as well. Uh, four, five, six, even eight degrees towards Mary's Harbor and Cartwright. The coast of Labrador will see again some scattered showers through the day, as will Happy Valley Goose Bay near six degrees and wet flurries with temps steady near three in the west. Sunday and beyond coming up. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, our Zach Gowdy always finds a happening place to be, and right now that's the Sheridan Hotel in St. John's. It's crawling with Klingons, Jedi Knights, and anime action heroes. Sci-fi on the rock is in full swing. This weekend, the annual convention is expected to draw thousands of science fiction fans. So, Zach, ha, what is it all about? For those who are uninitiated, explain Sci-Fi on the Rock. Well, just everywhere you look, you can see a beloved character, including here with the organizers, who are, of course, getting in on the fun. I'm joined by Mae Dalton Summers, Kit Sora, and Darnell Johnson, or as they're going to be known uh, today anyway, Merida from Brave, Rumpelstiltskin from Once Upon a Time, and the classic Snow White. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Congratulations on the convention so far. Thank you. Uh, Mae, you've been doing these conventions for years. This is Sci-Fi on the Rock 11. Just tell me about the growth of this event. We've gone from 300 people in a room half this size at the Mount Pearl Hotel 11 years ago to where we are today, which is well over 3,000 in a, every room they have available, and we're thrilled. What's made this so successful? I think it's just the community we have here. We love coming out together, and when you're doing books and TVs and movies, you're alone a lot, and it's just a lot of fun to come out and share that love with other people. Yeah. Well, when you're talking about books and TVs and movies, uh, Kit, let me ask you to describe all of the different fandoms that are represented here at Sci-Fi on the Rock. Oh, my goodness. There's no shortage of variety here. We've got everything from Disney to anime. We've got uh, Star Wars fans and Star Trek fans and Firefly, and there's just there's everything. Like, it's no longer just Sci-Fi. It's Sci-Fi and fantasy to see and pretty much whatever your imagination can come up with. Absolutely. I think when people think of sci-fi, you know, the classic Star Wars come to mind, but there are all <laughs> kinds of new characters and creations walking around this year. There certainly are, and it, you can tell. <laughs> exactly. And, and the boundaries, I think, of what people consider sci-fi and fa fantasy, for example, you guys are here all representing classic Disney characters. And Darnell, just tell me, uh, what does it add to the experience of Sci-Fi and the Rock to come in costume? Well, you get to show off uh, your creativeness, because a lot of people make their own costumes. And then another thing is you get to kind of show off your fandom flag show everyone what you are into, what you enjoy to do, and try to get other people interested in it. Wow. Uh, well, you guys certainly look in the part this weekend, and uh, for anyone who's interested in coming down, we're here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? That's right. You got her. All day. Fantastic, <laughs> All guys. Day. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, again, stick around. We've got lots more to come on tonight's episode of Here and Now, and as well, stay with us through the weekend on the CBCNL social media platforms. We've got Facebook Live, Twitter, Instagram. If you can't make it to the convention, we've got you covered. Reporting live from Sci-Fi on the Rock, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Well, the top official in the Premier's office is under scrutiny tonight for work he's doing when he's not on the job. The details after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Now back to the accusations of conflict of interest being leveled against government's most senior bureaucrat. Byrne Coffey is clerk of the Executive Council, but he's also a lawyer and has continued to represent clients he had before taking the government job. Now, one of those clients is a, Na a former Nalcor employee who's suing the Crown Corporation for wrongful termination. Opposition leader Paul Davis says that's a serious conflict. Here's our conversation from earlier today. So Mr. Davis, what is wrong with Byrne Coffey serving as clerk of executive council while also maintaining a portion of his private law practice? Everything is wrong with this. Everything absolutely wrong with this, especially when he has a lawsuit filed, uh, recently filed lawsuit against the government that he has a responsibility to serve. He is the most senior bureaucrat in government. He's the most senior employee. Every employee in government filters up to the clerk's office. The clerk has special privileges uh, and access to files, to records. Deputy ministers report to the clerk at the executive council as well. The clerk gives advice directly to the premier, approves briefing notes that, that go to the premier, gives him advice, direction, support and assistance to the cabinet process and cabinet meetings. So the clerk is, is engaged in a, at a level that, that's really difficult to explain how significant it is. And he's given a responsibility to serve the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and do in the best interest. Not on a part-time basis, on a full-time basis. He's paid almost $190,000 a year to do so. So to have time left over in his own schedule to work against the same group and organization, the same government, the same, the same agencies that he has a responsibility to serve, it makes no sense. Absolutely no sense at all. So you don't think that you can uh, keep those two jobs separate? There's no way you can do it. Cabinet ministers and people in these roles, they have, they have a responsibility to remove themselves from any conflicts. Just saying that there's a, there's a, a wall or separation is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Cabinet ministers can't run businesses. They have to put in blind trusts and separate themselves. And the clerk is no different. The clerk has to remove himself from this. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing concern, but I think we've struck rock bottom on this one. Can you tell us more about this Nalcor uh, lawsuit and, you know, what specifically you have a problem with? Well, I, well, I have a problem with all of it. And the lawsuit is about uh, an employee who was terminated from Nalcor. So it's kind of like someone going to work today, and I had someone say this to me. It's kind of like going to work today uh, and saying to your employer, I love working here, what a great job. And by the way, when I get off work 4 o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to sue you. And I'm going to support someone who's going to be critical of your own business. You, you can't do that. And as a clerk at the executive council, how can you work in the best interest of the province? If you have extra time on your hands and an opportunity to do more work at a time of all times, right now in, in all times of our history as a province, everybody needs to be pulling their oars together and making their best efforts to do what's best for the province. He should be working for the province. He's well compensated to do so. He's accepted a role and responsibility to do so. And he shouldn't be on a part-time basis uh, working against the government. You don't stop being the clerk at 5 o'clock. You're the clerk 24 hours a day. So there's an attack ad that the opposition has uh, just put out on social media. Can you tell me why you took that approach? Well, I, I haven't seen it, uh, so I, I don't know what's on it. Let me show you the attack ad. Sure. Okay, so this is the attack ad here. It says, top liberal government employee given the okay to sue Nalcor and make a personal profit right. conflict of interest. Right. So if you're successful in a lawsuit, then in the legal world, you get paid for doing so. And what Mr. Coffey is saying is that he's been given permission by the premier to do this, to sue the government mm -hmm. and to potentially profit from suing the government when he's paid a good price to protect and defend the government. What do you hope this accomplishes? Well, people need to understand the gravity and severity of this. And uh, I've had people reach out to me. My phone hasn't stopped this morning uh, from people calling me saying, Paul, ex explain this to me. Like, am I reading this right? Am I reading that the clerk of the executive council, the most senior staff person, the most senior employee in all of government, is actually suing the same government that he serves? I said, yes, that, that's true. And I've had people say, well, Paul, it can't be true. I said, well, I've seen the lawsuit that he signed this month against the government that he's paid very, very, very well to serve. He's there to serve the people of the province, not work against them. On here and now, next what's up? Ah!
Welcome back, and we're heading back to the Sci-Fi and the Rock Convention here in St. John's, where attendees are one of the main attractions. Costumes are a huge part of the event. Many people have spent months building their costumes by hand. Uh, we're going back to check in with Zach, who was just attacked by a Tyrannosaurus Rex, I think. You're okay, yeah, are you, Zach? I've, reco I've recovered. <laughs> so, yeah, it's okay. He took, he took a few bites, but they're on the backside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> so tell us, what are people uh, dressed up as this year? Well, take a look around. You can literally find any character from your imagination and be introduced to so many more uh, from classic characters like Chewbacca. Uh, many people ordering these incredibly uh, ostentatious custom outfits to new characters that are entirely, I'm assuming, this costume is entirely homemade. Yeah, exactly. I'm getting a nod from the night. And then we have some mix in between. What are you dressed as, young lady? Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Very, very nice. So from classic Egyptian, modern medieval, my favorite Chewy, you can find anything here at Sci-Fi on the Rock. Uh, but getting these costumes ready, of course, this wasn't put together this morning. Just a couple of weeks ago, I dropped in on a costume-making workshop to see how the cosplay pros do it. Especially now that there's only a few weeks, uh, all of my free time is spent on sewing and cutting out fabric and gluing, and I basically just text all of my friends and tell them that I can't hang out with them because I'm sewing. This morning, basically, we're just going to give a very basic tutorial on uh, the, the use and application of uh, EVA foam. And basically, what EVA foam is just floor mats. If you just look inside, that is just regular EVA foam mats. Yeah, the unique uh, ability of this, it's, it's very easy to cut, it's very easy to like, stick it together and we can shape it using heat and uh, a lot of times we can use like the knives we have, uh, wood burning tools to give the various textures that we need to achieve like a very organic looking yeah. um, body in general. I'm making a set of armor right now. That's kind of what my specialty is. So this armor is made out of a thermoplastic called Warbla. Uh, so it is comes in sheets, and then when you heat it up, you can mold it and make whatever you want. So I've made a breastplate right here. So this will fit perfectly right there for me. And it's all form made, so the nice thing is that it fits me perfectly. It's really nice to come together and work with lots of people because we get a chance to bounce ideas off of each other. Other. So something that I'm not necessarily great with myself, I can talk to someone else who's really good with it. Yeah, the more people that we see doing yeah. this kind of thing, the happier we are. Yes. Because we're not looking to make any money at this, you know what I mean? We do take commissions and stuff, but that's not our focus. Like, if we can pass this stuff back on to as many people as possible, that makes yeah. us happy. What's the reward for all that work? Uh, it's really just coming to a convention and seeing all of the people come up to you and say they recognize you and they like your costume. Tiny kids to adults 80 years old just see our creations and they're like just absolutely blown away. That in itself is worth more than anything. Just having the gratification of putting so much time into something and then people being blown away and wanting photos or videos, it just makes all of the hard work really worth it. Why are you? <laughs> You know, there are so many more great parts of this convention. We didn't even get to show you all the vendor tables. We could have gone into the board game room to one of the discussion panels. We could have met some of the sci-fi celebrities who are here. So much to see and do. You'll just have to... Well, you guys go ahead. I'm in your way. There you go. You just have to drop by, meet some of these lovely people, and if you can't get to the convention, follow us on social media all through the weekend. CBCNL, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be right here at Sci-Fi on the Rock. Boarding live for here and now, I'm Zach Gowd. How about the bow tie Zach had on tonight? <laughs> very CBC sharp. CBC bow tie. The CBC yeah. bow tie. Very sharp. Very sharp. <laughs> you should get I didn't one of those. notice that yeah. it was CBC. Yeah, yeah. two CBC Zach. logos on it there. Mm -hmm. It's cute. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move along <laughs> before we get to the weather. 
It is a big night tonight, besides Sci-Fi on the Rock. It's uh, great for people in the arts in this province. ArtsNL is hosting its annual awards show and celebration. Yes, uh, lots of great work to show off for sure. Ten nominees are for the four awards being handed out, and of course CBC will be there Douglas to cover Dunn's the event. Yeah, and if you want to see the Arts music, Award Show tonight, you're in luck. We're going to air it live on CBC NL's Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. The show kicks off at 7:30. Hmm. So for all the people who are going to be there. Uh, how's the weather getting to and from the rooms? Mm -hmm. uh, looking pretty quiet. Uh, variable temperatures today. We went from uh, 13 degrees to 4 one hour later. Now we're back to 12. Guess what? The winds have shifted back to southwest here in St. John's. And have a look at temperatures across Atlanta, Canada. 5 in Cornerbrook, just 2 in Gander. 12 in St. John's with the return to the southwest wind that will stay with us through the overnight now. And we are looking at, uh, again, uh, that warmer air that's over the Maritimes is going to be pushing in across most of Newfoundland for tomorrow on the other side of this frontal boundary, which has been kind of parked over us for the last 24 hours or so. Some scattered showers and drizzle on the go. That continues through tonight, and uh, forecast models projecting another line here through Saturday morning. I think it's not quite as steady as what you're seeing there with this model, but certainly a chance of showers into the morning quieter into the afternoon. Some lingering drizzle possible for the west coast. This cold front will be funneling through Labrador and then we'll move through Newfoundland Sunday morning. Note the timing here for that front for uh, St. John's in the east. I think we'll be near seven degrees on Sunday morning, but temperatures will fall. We'll see some uh, brightness into the afternoon, not ruling out a sunbreak, but I think we'll also see a bit of grapple and maybe even a wet flurry for St. John's and that northeast coast for Sunday uh, into the afternoon hours. And then for Monday, area of high pressure comes in and clearing us out quite nicely. So it's a cooler but quieter start to the week. And then we'll watch our next system approach for midweek. We'll talk about that seven day trend in just a moment. So with those West southwesterly winds tomorrow. We're talking about 15, 16 degree possibilities from the southern shore to St. John's to Clarenville towards Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor and back towards the Humber Valley. Uh, what eastern parts of the Buren Peninsula, including Marystown in that mix as well. Uh, Onshore winds will again keep temperatures in that six, seven, eight degree range for much of the south coast. Uh, onshore winds in the Bay of uh, Exploits, of course, and also the west coast. Cloud cover likely dominating with those onshore winds. Temperatures capped here near 10 degrees. Uh, up through Portageois and St. Anthony, chances some scattered showers here as well, but brightening into the uh, afternoon hours. Same thing through the Mary's Harbor region, Cartwright, McCovic, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Labrador City. A look at Sunday. Again, I think we peak four, five, six, seven degrees for the east coast, including St. John's in the northeast into central, but temperatures fall as the winds kick in from the northwest into the afternoon and that cooler air right rushes in. We'll see that chance of a shower mixed with a wet flurry. Isolated risk of flurries for the west coast, but that's mainly for the morning. Looking at sun and cloud for the afternoon. Temperatures near 2 and sun and cloud for most of Labrador on Sunday as well. So Sunday looking like a pretty good day. A little warmer along that south coast as well. 6 to as warm as 7, 8 degrees. Note for Monday that quiet weather uh, for uh, Newfoundland and uh, still an isolated risk of a flurry for the west coast, but uh, overall pretty quiet. Tuesday looks nice. Wednesday our next system arrives, uh, but quieter for Thursday into Friday. And Labrador again looking at a system approaching for Wednesday, but overall a pretty quiet seven day. Now it is time to see who's our young athlete of the day, and that would be Charlotte Windsor, who's seven years old from Labrador City. Yes, she recently participated in her very first swim meet and set two club records. Way to go, Charlotte. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. Well, next, we'll head to St. John, New Brunswick for a look at last night's East Coast Music Awards.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, last night at the East Coast Music Awards, folk and rock artists took home most of the big wins. Unfortunately, no wins for artists in this province. As Stephanie Van Campen reports, there's a lot more than fiddles and guitars coming from the East Coast music scene. Some say the industry has been too slow to recognize non-traditional talent. East Coast repping Scotians and new fees. Far from its historic roots in folk and acoustic, the East Coast is quickly becoming a hotbed for hip hop, pop, and electronic music. Ooh, baby, I love Halifax based Neon Dreams had a breakout year. Their latest single was streamed 5 million times and sold 35,000 units. Thinking if I never left Toronto. All while keeping the East Coast their home. It's a lot easier now. It's, you don't have to be at the front doorstep. You can do it over email, do it over the internet. And we've never Still, the band that. says the region offers new electronic groups fewer opportunities to connect and perform. I just one day expect, uh, hope to see diversity. Just understanding that it's not... You know, when you think of the East Coast, you think of multiple genres and not necessarily one specific thing. Critics say East Coast artists without a fiddle or guitar miss out on grants, aren't equally recognized in award shows, and don't have enough representation in music associations like the East Coast Music Awards. DJ Brian Pellrine agrees. There's a lot of artists around here that are making huge, huge steps on international scales that we just see them being kind of slept on until these organizations want to play catch up. Some artists are taking things into their own hands, creating a new maritime-wide music association to provide support and connections for artists outside the traditional genres. The East Coast Music Awards say they are making strides. In the last four years, they've added new categories for electronic and dance recordings. I mean, the East Coast is renowned for its more acoustic-based music, but there's no way that you can uh, deny the fact that uh, electronic music is hugely popular and the East Jamaica will continue to reflect that. But in the meantime, these digital artists will keep getting their music out their own way. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, in baby animal news tonight, the new river otters at the Oregon Zoo made their first splash today. The keepers said the mother carried each otter by the scruff of its neck and dunked them in the water and swims with them to teach them how to swim. Yes, good thing baby otters are extremely buoyant, so no <laughs> need for a life jacket. <laughs> so cute. We'll be right back.
just sliding in place. <laughs> okay, this one's for you, Ryan. Uh, have a look at this. Perfect. Nice. Well done. <laughs> well, uh, the rookie hockey player uh, Phenom took some batting practice with his fellow Maple Leafs yesterday and socked one right into the right field stands. That's right. That is Austin Matthews, who will be Rookie of the Year uh, by all accounts uh, at the NHL Awards in uh, just a couple of weeks. And yeah, even though the Leafs are out of the playoffs. Wow. Quite an athlete if he can hit yeah. a home run. Done. Yeah, <laughs> and win rookie of the year, which he will. Yeah, good summer job for him, right? Okay, let's have a look now. Being Friday, who's celebrating anniversaries and birthdays? Happy 52nd anniversary to Effie and Lloyd Wareham of Arnold's Cove, who celebrated on the 23rd. Happy 97th birthday to Pat Mulrooney, formerly of Barhaven, now in Southern Harbor. Anniversary greetings to Scott and Manetta Pelly of Deer Lake, who celebrated their 52nd last week. Happy 53rd anniversary to Gordon and Patricia Vivian of Mount Pearl. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Bill and Barbara Kenway on the 25th. Happy 90th birthday wishes to Reverend Arnold Torville of Gander, who celebrated on the 24th. Happy 54th anniversary to Jim and Lillian Coombs of Plum Point. And it's 55 years of marriage for Walter and Madonna Kenway. Congratulations. Happy anniversary to Alistair and Janine Chapman of Benton, celebrating 64 years of marriage this Sunday. Birthday wishes to this remarkable woman. Sister Helen Bonia is 101 years old. She still teaches literacy two afternoons a week and is at the Presentation Convent. Congratulations to Margaret Hillier of Bishop's Falls, who will be celebrating her 99th birthday on May 2nd. Margaret is a war bride from Scotland. Happy birthday to Jack Brown in St. John's, who will be celebrating his 94th birthday tomorrow. Happy 50th anniversary tomorrow to Jane and Walter Tucker of St. Phillips. Wishing Blanche and Roy Compton of Pasadena a happy 57th wedding anniversary. Birthday greetings to William Best of St. John's, who celebrated his 94th birthday this week. He lives with his wife, Nita, at Glenbrook Lodge. Bernard and Elizabeth Way of Grand Falls, Windsor, are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary today. Happy anniversary to Max and Joyce Rose, who will celebrate their 57th anniversary this Sunday. Best wishes to Russell and Annie Avery on their 65th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations to Terry and Ida Reed of Newville on their 50th anniversary. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Jack and Mary Cormier of Stephenville. Happy 67th anniversary to Jim and Mary McCarthy of Upper Island Cove. Happy 56th anniversary to Harvey and Lorna Boone of Campbellton, who are celebrating their special day today. Edmund and Helen Seymour of Bay Roberts will be celebrating their golden wedding anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations to Thomas and Cavell Sharp on their 60th anniversary. Isaac and Mary Morgan of Seal Cove and CBS are celebrating 65 years together. Happy 55th wedding anniversary to Harvey and Mary Luffman of Harbor Grace, who celebrated yesterday. Happy 66th wedding anniversary to Amelia and Bill Nelson of St. John's. Adelard and Phyllis O'Brien of Lancelou, Labrador, celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary this week. Happy 92nd birthday coming up on Monday to Mary Ryan of Chapels Cove. Birthday greetings to Gordon Lannon, who celebrated his 95th birthday this week. Happy 90th birthday to Kathleen Sutton of Trapassi. And best wishes to Elizabeth Croft from Aquafort, who also turned 90 years old this week. Nice. Congratulations once again to all of you fine folks. Have a wonderful weekend. See you back here Monday. Good night, everyone. Good night.